Hey, everybody. Welcome to Dear Franny. I am your host, Catherine LeBlanc, founder of Franchise Fractionals. Uh, today, I'm calling it our training episode because I've got some fantastic uh, operators on with me today to talk a little bit about what they're seeing in their training programs. Um, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves. We'll start with Garrick. Hi, thanks, Catherine. Uh, my name is Garrick Robert. I'm a 16-year uh, franchise uh, uh, experienced uh, veteran uh, working for brands such as Raising Cane's, uh, Smoothie King, Service Master, and uh, for the last six years, uh, I've been in operations for a franchise brand called Salad Station uh, in the role the last year as VP of Operations. So uh, most of my career in operations and training, uh, some training focus there as well. Uh, so looking forward to uh, our discussion today on training specifically. Awesome. And Catherine? Yep. Catherine Merriman uh, for the last 26 years uh, in franchising uh, for one brand, and that would be Smoothie King. Uh, so I'm a rare bird staying at uh, one, one franchise brand, but I love it. Um, dabbling in uh, most recently training in ops services, but over the years I've worked in marketing uh, administrative project management, different things. So thanks for having me. Yes. I'm very excited to chat with you guys. Um, having worked with y'all, uh, personally, I know the expertise that y'all are bringing to the table. And so I'm excited to share that expertise with our listeners, but first we're going to start with our favorite, uh, segment called hot takes. Um, we had a fun discussion before we started recording about some of the, the stuff that we'll be talking about. So I'm excited to dig in. Um, I'm going to let Catherine go first and put her on the spot. So Catherine, what do you have for our hot take today? So my hot take is uh, franchisee forums. Um, that something that is usually not uh, embraced at times uh, because, you know, you might only hear from the same folks and depending on uh, the time of year, it could be in what's going on in the brand. It could be very negative. Um, and every once in a while gets sprinkled with some positivity. Um, Usually, again, not well embraced. I've always looked at it as at least I know they're talking about me and I know what they're saying and I know how to fix it. Um, if I don't, if they're not there in the forum, then I, I don't know. And then I, everyone's speculating, um, but it's usually not something everyone uh, looks at positively. positively. Yeah, I, I think that's interesting because I, a little bit of like a fear comes over <laughs> me when I jump into a franchisee forum and, and to your point, you know, yes, you get a sense of what they're talking about and at least they're saying it in front of you. And so you can get some solutions going. But I think, you know, especially as, as franchisors, you get into this business because of the passion you have for making other people successful. And when you're, you're reading things negatively about your work, it can be really demotivating. Um, and so I I like like the wall that you put up as far as like, it's not going to be about me. It's going to be about what do they need so that I can get them what they need. Um, I think I, I think I struggle with that still of, you know, putting your heart and soul into something and not necessarily hitting the way that you want to hit, that you want it to hit. Garrett, yeah. what do you think? So, so Catherine, your take is, is that they're positive and that I, Francis Brand should have them? Yeah, I like them. I yeah. mean, does it some days, does it make me want to jump out the window? Yes, by all means, yeah. take a step back. Um, but Look, that's extremely fair. And that's a that that's a tough one. I think every franchise brand has to de deal with. Right. And uh, so I, uh, a story to share there when I started here at Salad Station and uh, very grassroots. I mean, the brand didn't have a lot of things when I started. So we created a lot. Uh, we did not have an intranet system at all. So we went through that process. And then when we finally decided on a provider, we had to make the decision of whether to turn on the forum or not. And um, uh, that was a lot of deliberation back and forth. And uh, at the time, we made the decision not to turn on the forum, mostly for the reasons that you guys uh, just said is, um, you know, it's hard sometimes to hear these things and uh, to have to deal with them, um, uh, even the ones that are accurate, right? I mean, it, you know, there are a lot of things that come from your franchisees that are hard to hear, but uh, fully accurate. And, uh, but uh, hear, hearing those types of things on a daily basis can be demoralizing. And uh, you're, you know, you're out there to be criticized in your job every day. There's probably not a lot of careers where that exists outside of professional athlete <laughs> and, and maybe a couple of other <laughs> professional, right? I mean, you're, you're getting criticized every day. Openly, so that's tough. Now we made that decision several years ago, 
And uh, uh, actually still currently, even though we've changed internet providers, still have not enacted a franchisee forum. Um, now we do try to do a good job of staying in touch with our franchisees. Um, we have what I believe are an elevated amount of vis uh, visits uh, compared to other brands. And that's been um, a key marker that our founders wanted. They wanted to provide uh, more than average support. Um, so we we do at least two in-person visits per quarter, uh, which can be a little tough to execute, uh, but that's the minimum that we try and hit. Uh, in addition, we try to do uh, some level of virtual interaction um, uh, directly and then uh, once a quarter, and then uh, we try to maintain uh, video uh, announcements and messaging once a month. Um, so, and we do get feedback uh, during that as well, though we try to keep that relatively controlled. So even though we don't have the forum, we try to actively stay in contact. And look, I understand that we're probably not getting some, <laughs> some feedback uh, during those things, but uh, for now, I feel like it's, it's worked pretty well for us. Um, I don't know that there's a right or wrong. I think in that instance, we probably could have decided to do it and we would have it now and we'd just be be uh, dealing with it, but probably wouldn't, uh, there there wouldn't have been any topics brought up that we already don't get brought to our attention. Uh, anyway, it's just, I think the vehicle by which that feedback comes to you. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I'm curious to, uh... Because I think that the, at the end of the day, it's feedback. We have to have mm -hmm. an, an, a mechanism to get feedback from franchisees or else we're not, we are doing them a disservice. And so how do you want to structure that feedback yeah. mechanism? And, you know, I think on the forums, I, I, it is a good indication of, you know, hey, if they're going on there and asking questions that you think are obvious or raising issues that you think were already addressed, then something's missing. And mm -hmm. so it can give you kind of a, a canary in the coal mine of, you know, hey, we're not hitting on some of these things we thought we were hitting on. Sure. Um, but on the flip side, you know, look, I think at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're saying there's pros and cons and different ways to mm -hmm. do it. Because for me, on the flip side, it, I, I do see where the squeaky wheel gets the oil and the negativity gets rewarded through response. And so if you, you know, create a, an environment where they're only getting attention through a forum or they're seeing that the most negative person is getting a lot of t attention because of what he or she posts in the forum, it can um, create an, in, in, unintentionally uh, a, a culture of feedback that is not positive. Um, so that's a good, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to add that to our arsenal of like tips to tips on how to approach the forum so that it becomes yeah. a productive environment, right? right. Because you want exactly. the feedback, um, but you want to create a productive environment to get it in. Yeah, that, that what, actually is a really, that's a really good one to bring up. I, I didn't think about it. If I just to add one more thing, you know, because we chose not to, to have one, um, young franchise brands that are coming up and, and trying to make that decision, uh, they should just be aware that if they don't uh, formalize one, that your franchisees will. Uh, so, yep. and you just need to be prepared to um, deal with that how it is. I would, I will say that we we know about the one that exists that our franchisees have created, and uh, we don't have direct access to it. Um, but we do find out about what is being discussed there, uh, and we do our best to uh, deal with those issues. And so it has not become uh, something that we have not been able to manage. And so we have not felt the need to create one on our own. Catherine, did you have anything else to add? The only other thing I was going to add is that it does give the ability to create a different type of camaraderie between other franchise between franchisees and franchisees, because sometimes they self-police in the sense of someone's really going off. They're yeah. like, wait a minute, let's come back to that. This let's let me set the record straight on, on how I perceive something or whatnot. Yeah. Um, so it does just create a little bit of camaraderie between the two. Yeah. They probably achieve the same thing within their own form as well. Um, just, you don't have the access to it. You just get the screenshots of it, right. Of like, Hey, you might want to address this <laughs> in the next communication. So. Yeah. Those moments are the best. <laughs> <laughs> right. Awesome. All right, Greg, what's your hot take today? So, um, Watched a very interesting TED talk recently about uh, poverty stricken areas and uh, the inability of people within those areas uh, to come out of it or the battles that they have to face and the obstacles that are ahead of them and um, uh, 
how just significantly difficult it is for anybody to come out of that. And uh, there are great stories in, in those situations, but really laying out what those areas look like and, uh, and the struggles that uh, those residents have. And it just made me think about the type of markets that we go into as a brand, really all the brands I've worked for, but particularly uh, where I work now, we tend to thrive in, uh, we're based in the South. We tend to thrive in relatively rural areas, uh, although highly populated and got me thinking about uh, the people who that we, we hire uh, that come work for us and um, the responsibility that we have uh, as an employer of them and as the franchisor to the franchisee who employs them um, to uh, create opportunities for them beyond uh, uh, working at the brand itself. Although on its surface, that's really our goal is to find the best people to work there in the labor market and keep them for as long as possible. Um, that struggle that they have to move beyond that. I don't know that a lot of franchisors think about that uh, or put that near the top of their list of things they should be, be working uh, for. So, uh, you know, my hot take is that uh, as, as a leader in the franchise brand or as the franchisee who's owning that business, our responsibility should be to make these people better than employment just with us. Obviously that creates an obstacle, <laughs> non, non-stop recurrence of recruiting, but we should be trying to move them beyond. Uh, I think we, we have a responsibility to do so. And uh, you know, I've always touted at this level that we have opportunity for anybody who goes to work in any of our stores, if they work hard and prove themselves to come work here at our office. Now that's not the path for everybody. Some people might have to move, leave their families and that that may not be the case for everyone, but uh, I always try to put that out there. Um, not a lot of uh, takes on that uh, by, by people out there, but I, I do try to make it known, especially when we open a store, typically give a little welcome speech and I talk about the opportunities here. And, uh, you know, a lot of these people, in, in our case, working in the restaurant industry, they don't see or know what opportunity, like they just have never been exposed to opportunities beyond sweeping a floor and working a register, right? And I try to paint a picture of where I came from starting out like that as a kid. And not that I've achieved some tremendous level of success, but maybe it's more than what they thought they could achieve, right? And uh, I don't know if enough brands do something like that or make that part of their uh, uh, training materials or discussion with teams, but um, I try to do that uh, with our brand when we go into new markets and, and open stores. And I would add that, add to that, you know, we look at fran franchise growth is really important to any franchise brand. And a lot of times we're looking at locations um, that, you know, look, I've been a lot, a part of a lot of emerging brands and we're always looking at the big major markets and how do we break into those major markets. And so those smaller secondary and, and even smaller markets can sometimes get overlooked. And I think especially, I mean, with you guys, the, the health food aspect of mm -hmm. things, right? is such a game changer to bring yep. accessibility into those small, smaller rural communities. I think to, to add to what you're saying as far as understanding the responsibility we have as franchisors to the people that are working for those franchisees in those markets, I also think that there's a uh, you know a layer there about you know thinking about the community that we're going into. Mm -hmm. How are we benefiting the community? And is our product going to bring you know, that benefit um, to those those places that are just a map dot, right? To yep. to people that are in offices and, and making plans. Yep. Um, and so I think that's a great call out to to think about what, what are those communities and how are we empowering them through franchising um, and being more intentional about that. Catherine, yep. what about at, at Smoothie King? Do you guys have any um, kind of career pathing or, uh, or training programs that help those employees think bigger? We do, um, in particular on the corporate side with our corporate stores. And then we try to implement the same with franchisee conversations that if you're going to grow, it's best to grow within the team you have. Mm -hmm. And if you can help elevate the people that you've brought in that has the same type of energy, passion, drive as you and show them there there's more than just this one store that you have that you're going to you know be opening more stores or you know, there's even for the potential for you to become a franchisee on your own one day, right? If that's, mm -hmm. if that's what drives you and, but showing kind of painting the picture that there is more than just 
blending smoothies, right? Like you, mm-hmm. you, you can achieve more. You just got to set your mind to it. And, and hopefully those franchisees sharing the stories from where they came from, right? Like, you know, sometimes it's painted like, oh, you just got this. No, I worked my butt off right. and I got to where I am today. Um, and, and showing that now, you know, I maybe started with Smoothie King, but now I've added these other brands or done these other things and how I've grown um, and just helping them understand, like you go for a team member and team captain to a manager to, you know, a field trainer or whatnot at the corporate office. If, you know, there's that want there again, in some cases you got to move and do different things, but if you want it, it's there for you to achieve it. You just have to decide if that's what you want. Um, well, I think you make a great point on, you know, outside of the path that Garrick laid out around, you know, here's how you can you elevate outside of the restaurant, that multi-unit infrastructure is incredibly powerful. Um, and there are, you know, especially in the restaurant industry, as we know, just so many multi-unit operators who have a an infrastructure that rivals the franchisor. Uh, and so there are a lot of opportunities um, to to rise up out of that that, you know, mopping position um, into some of that uh, more management position within multi-unit ownership as well. Um, So awesome. Good. Okay. My hot take today. Um, I believe we're taught, we talk a lot about responsible franchising on LinkedIn at least. So um, in thinking about that, one thing I've been thinking about is, you know, I, I think that we need our, our franchise prospects, the people that are looking for a franchise brand, um, needs to hold the brands they're talking to accountable to their sales process. They, The franchise prospects need to do a thorough due diligence before they enter into an agreement with a franchisee and the, or a franchisor. And, and the reason why I'm, I'm saying that is, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of folks through this podcast and in my network around fast growth and franchise brands and should you be franchising? And and theoretically, the industry should be able to regulate themselves through a similar supply and demand, just like in a consumer market, where if you have a, a business that you've developed and you can tell, you know, have someone else be successful at it, that creates the the supply and demand for it. And so you know, with franchise prospects, I think the onus needs to be on them to do the due diligence, follow the process. There's a reason why you do validation calls. There's a reason why you have to wait two weeks before you can sign an agreement. And it's because those protections are in place so that you are doing the due diligence you need to make sure that it's a a viable business for you and for your community. Um, There's only so much the franchisor can predict before you go into business. and so I, my, that's my hot take. Franchise prospects need to, and not that they're not doing a great job, but yeah. you know, I, I think they they need to hold the franchisors accountable to their sales process. Yeah, I mean that's a, that's a good point. Uh, you know, I, I kind of liken it to uh, car shopping, right? You know, you uh, at least in our case, uh, we get a lot of our franchisees who've gone and experienced the brand somewhere. Uh, they don't live in that market. They go experience it. They love it. And the first thing they think about is, uh, man, this would do really well where I live. And they've probably already started the process mentally. Before then, I'd like to do something else, whether it's having a side business or change uh, out of a corporate job into uh, a business where I can control Uh, my destiny and have influence and control my hours. And uh, they kind of just get latched on to the first thing. Right. And Mm -hmm. uh, would say in some instances uh, that that's happened to us. And in some of those, it's worked out great. And in some, you know, maybe it wasn't the right decision and and other things ensue. But uh, yeah, I think it's pretty critical for both ends to do due diligence, right? Like everybody should just take a breather, (laughs) assess Mm -hmm. the situation, say, Hey, uh, is this the right brand for me? Is owning a business the right thing for me? I will say that in many cases, people have made that decision and it wasn't just our brand or another. They probably shouldn't have made the decision or it wasn't the right time or uh, other factors may, maybe would would uh, have made it better. So um, yeah, but it's the shiny thing in front of you. You get very excited. Your heart rate's elevated. You're, that's all you can think about, right? And then you you just jump right into it. And mm-hmm. uh, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day, you know, it's a, you really need to look at it as about a, at a minimum, a 10 year commitment, even, I mean, I know it says 10 years on the franchise agreement, but really to get into something, 
I mean, it's really hard to do it for less than 10 years, I would say. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a significant portion of your life at a minimum. And at max, you could do it for the rest of your life in, in mm -hmm. some of the great cases, I think. So um, you really need to take your time. It's, I mean, it's essentially like making the marriage decision, except mm -hmm. just in a business context. So uh, I agree 100%. And then also on our side as well, we probably should be very disciplined uh, in that approach. That's easy for me to say, I don't work in the sales department, right? So. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, with both, I, I think it's, uh, you know, sometimes I don't think they do much due diligence. And then when things don't go the way they envisioned it, it's like, well, you, you know, you told me, you sold me. And I'm like, but did you talk to others? Did you think about, did you, really understand what it meant to get the business off the ground, especially going into an emerging market, you know, where mm -hmm. then a name might not be known that, you know, you, you might have to sweat a little bit, cry a little bit before you get to where you need to be. Um, so yeah, I definitely agree. And to Garrick's point, both sides, mm -hmm. right. Needs to do the due diligence. Um, you know, uh, cause on, from the training aspect, that first time you get the call of like, well, they don't want to go to four weeks of training. I'm like, Oh, they like just two days, they think is sufficient for them. I'm like, oh, okay, great. Okay, good. We'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. Right. We've only been doing this for 12. Y'all are at 1200 units now, I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You don't know anything. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for sharing. Um, we're going to jump into our question, but first a quick word from Franchise Fractionals. Uh, scaling your franchise doesn't mean going it alone. With Franchise Fractionals, you have access to top tier talent you need when you need it. From finance to operations and marketing, our fractional executives have been where you want to go. Don't let the full-time commitment of executive roles hold you back. Visit FranchiseFractionals.com today to discover how our leaders are, can help pave the way for your franchise's success. Okay, so our question for today um, we are revamping our training materials. And before we get started, I'd love to know how other systems standardize their processes while trying to accommodate various learning preferences and varying levels of prior experience. So awesome question. I'm glad they're thinking through this before they developed all the things and, and it's not working for them. Um, so Catherine, let me have you go first on this one, because I know you've been through um, probably every iteration of training materials there are. A few different times. Uh, yes, so this the most recent one we did um, was just a few years ago where we revamped our team member fundamentals, which was our you know entry level training program. Um, and we did it with uh, getting a focus group of uh, franchisees and managers, some that have been in the system. Um, a while, call them legacy, and then some that just opened up because it's two different perspectives. And then also thinking about age, uh, you know, because there's a wide variety of folks. And of course, the team members are going to go a little, they're going to be younger, it's going to be 16 to 19 years old coming in, and they're going to learn a little bit differently as well. But franchisees have to embrace what you're doing, because if they don't embrace it, they're not going to use it, and you're going to spend this time and money on it, and it's not going to work out. Um, so getting that group together and finding, understanding what works for them and getting their team members ramped up, um, and understand what kind of successes they're having with it. You know, are they getting the results they should be getting from it? Um, and then also helping under, it also helped us understand, um, gaps and opportunities and what we had and what maybe we needed to fill in, um, and elevate and improve upon, um, because even though the information has been around for a long time, like you still have to evolve it and don't just mm -hmm. get set in your ways. Well, that's what's been working forever. Yeah, I get that. But things have changed. Digital has been added, new products and things like that. Um, and then also use the same group to get feedback as you, go, you get it initially, then use the same group to get feedback to say, does this make sense? Get some team members to go through it. Um, and the other piece I'd say is just you know, this focus group is a small group, right? Because you can't get too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, but then you could also do a survey to just get feedback and what what is the training sentiment on the current plan that's out there. So then that way, you know, what what's what people are as viewed as working today or not working um, before you, you know, grow it or change it moving forward. Has any of the feedback that you've gotten surprised you? Like, did you miss the mark completely one time? 
sometimes I know, I don't think we missed the mark completely, but I do think it helps identify different gaps that you're like, Oh, I didn't realize that was missing. Um, and, and actually now we're going through a, where we're implementing a program we don't have. And as more things come up, I'm like, Oh, that's going to be solved with this program. So it's just different things that there that you're like, the, the gaps have been there, but the, the light wasn't shined on it. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, it was pretty interesting. And, and also though, you know, got to keep in mind, manage expectations. You're not going to make everyone happy because you're going to, you know, try to use some things that appeal to the younger generation that the older generation is like, that's, you know, that does make no sense to me. Why are you doing right. that? Right. Yeah. Um, it's like in a different language for them. I bet. Exactly. Uh, yeah. so actually, and just yesterday we were actually talking about, you know, making sure with things that we do now is we, uh, the approach we take. So then we try to do, we're going to attempt to do a better job of setting things up and why we're going a certain way with things. And not only just training, just in communications and programs to just help paint a, a better picture for folks. Awesome. Garrick, what about you? What has been your experience in trying to match different learning styles in your training process? Yeah, so it's been very interesting for us. Uh, so when I started here six years ago, uh, really the only document we had was an uh, operations manual. That was it. Uh, and I can remember coming in my first two days of work, I visited the two franchisees we had. And then uh, on day three through about day 21, I sat in our conference room and I just wrote material. And uh, our CEO, I know, was looking at me with kind of a funny eye, wondering, like, what, what was I doing just sitting in a room? And then one day I turned over well, everything that I had been working on for about three weeks. And I remember, you know, his eyes kind of popped up. He's like, oh, wow, I didn't I, I didn't realize what you were doing. And so I essentially was creating everything <laughs> that it, it, any medium to large franchise size brand would have. And most of it revolved around training. Um, the uh, if I could share uh, just a an anecdote from my first day, my first visit, I went to, I walked in a store and I just kind of stood behind the salad bar and watched what happened. I asked questions of the team members and um, a guest walked up and he pointed at an item and he asked the team member, what is this? And uh, she looked at me <laughs> and, she, and I said, well, uh, and I just kind of looked at her. I said, well, well uh, what is this item? She says, I don't know. She said, it's brand new. We just got it. I was okay. I said, could you take me to where you got it from and let's figure this out together. So she walks me in the back. She shows me what it is. Uh, it's called Sweetie Drops. It's okay. The guest is not going to know what this is. What is a Sweetie Drop? So I flip it over, read the ingredient. Number one ingredient is Sweetie Drops. Okay. This is going to be tougher than I thought. Uh, so then I walk back out, I explain Sweetie Drops. So I, so I try one. I'm like, okay, it's a small sweet pepper. So I go back out and I describe it to the uh, uh, to the guest, happy. Well, he's like, oh yeah, I like sweet baby. Makes it, makes a salad. Oh. So later that day, I drove back to the office and I said, okay, I'm gonna give you some feedback on what I saw today. I said, uh, I said, could you tell me about this product, Sweetie Drops? Team member had no idea. He said, uh, yeah, it was something I saw last week, so I ordered it for all the stores. So okay. I said, nobody has any clue what this is, including your team members. I said there was no rollout product. Like we didn't train anybody on any of this. I was like, okay, I got to start from the beginning. Like we roll out a product, there's got to be a process for this. Right. So yeah. we, we had to step way, way back. So the uh, integration of just a rollout guide, any materials that I wrote, always keep in mind two targets uh, and, and Catherine mentioned them. So you always got to think about the team member, the person who's executing at the front line. And then you th need to think about the manager or owner, the leadership aspect of it. Uh, the person who's training and teaching, or maybe there are higher level things that they need to think about. So you're always trying to create materials for for two groups. Um, and then how do you administer the material, right? So is it mm -hmm. technology, which I can tell you, we went pretty heavy early on. Um, we use uh, some digital tools in Salad Station, and those digital tools allow us to get training materials out to stores very quickly, and we can make changes very easily. Um, but what we learned in uh, the process of doing that over years is you would think digital tools would be readily accessible and, and something that young, the younger generation would want. But we found that creating more tactile tools that are more expensive and harder to administer and harder to update 
actually are more effective in the store setting. So it provides more work for us, but we have found more consistency by the use of that tool or more access of it by the team member. Uh, so you have to think about um, uh, those things uh, when you're trying to lay out the tool, which tool is it? How is it best going to be administered? Maybe it's both to some extent, right? And then Catherine also mentioned, mentioned this. I always try to field test as much as I can. So if we create something, I try and run it through a couple of stores or at least members of the ops team because I can't think of everything or our training director can't think of everything. We, we try to do the best we can uh, with our experience. But um, like Catherine said, you know, when you put something out there, you will get feedback on it, right? And I prefer to try and get ahead of that as much as possible. So I try to test it as quickly as we can. We, we tend to, because we're small, we tend to move very quick here. So I try to get things out quick and give as much feedback, make those changes and get it out. And we're not perfect in that process. Um, so I'm sure if, if we had a franchisee form and you were to dial into it, you might hear that, right? So, but we don't. So, uh, but I get that feedback other ways, usually with a direct call from a franchisee say, hey, you know, it would have been good if you had included this. And most of the time it's very fair feedback and I'm very open to those things. So um, uh, so we've done a lot of that here. I mean, there's been a lot, everything has been created really for this brand over the last six years since I've been here and uh, by many members of the team, not, not just me. So it's been really interesting to watch this evolution over the last few years as we add experienced team members and they bring their ideas and what those things look like. Because truth be told, I haven't worked in a store in several years, right? I don't, you know, I spent a lot of time in ops visiting stores and and getting my hands dirty at Smoothie King and, and here, but uh, in, in this level of role, I, I just don't spend as much and I can't know every single thing that happens in a store. So I think it's very important to get that feedback from your training team, your ops team, whoever it is, people are actually doing these things out in the field. So I think, you know, you said something um, about technology, right? So technology versus, how you know, uh, more in hand um, mm -hmm. materials. I think that there's certainly a push. We see the younger generations, um, the folks who are working these entry level jobs on their phones constantly. Mm -hmm. You know, where I've heard about, you know, how do we make training videos more like TikTok videos? Yep. How do I incorporate the trends? into what I'm working on from a training perspective. How do I find a platform that is going to be accessible? Because I think, Garrett, to your point, some of the logistics on a training platform um, need to be thought through as far as how are people going to access this? Do they have Wi-Fi? Are they going to be watching this at home at the home or in, in the store? And is there a computer for them to watch it? And is there time for the, all of that? Um, yep. And so... I think that, uh, you know, it, it's interesting to hear you say that you guys kind of do both with the stuff that's in store in their hands, having a little bit more um, umph to, to getting the word across because that's where they are, right? That's what they're working their job. That's where they're getting the information. Um, I'd love for you guys to tell me about about how y'all view that technology piece. You know, we talked about two different audiences, the franchise audience, franchisee audience versus the team member audience. Um, but I think that, you know, the next generation is always a question, right? <laughs> and so what are you guys seeing as far as what are, or what are y'all trying um, in order to stay, you know, at level with that next generation of employee? I'll let Catherine go first and I'll, I'm going to take those while you talk. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, so we, we do try to, uh, we do a little bit of both to Garrick's about with technology and in store because if you go all technology route they just put them in front of a computer and then they think they'll get it and then they're fast forwarding through videos and whatnot um so then that wasn't real successful so to the point of like okay we have to come back with a team member poster that goes out in the kit every time something new launches to make mm -hmm. sure put it on your communication board with the key points so that way if someone's not paying attention in a course maybe they're reading it in the back when they so on the communication and then also making sure we don't forget the leadership of the organization to provide them the tools and resources to train on it. So here's a trainer trainer guide. Here's a um, checklist to go through as you're setting everybody up, what you should do when. Um, and the other thing we're really trying to 
go, we, we've done, we tried the little TikTok videos and we do once, once a month, maybe we call it what's appealing. And it's like, try to be funny and real quick uh, to hit on some high points of what's happening. Um, we haven't gotten the viewership we want on those, although, but you know, we're still hitting, I'm like, we're hitting someone. So someone's reading it. Uh, but the other thing is really trying to bring back shift huddles. So really trying to elevate a team captain shift lead role um, in the shift huddle because, and here's a template of what you should do, what you should talk about um, to really just give them that quick snippet. And it's right there. You know, they got the little group um, of what the high points are for the week. So then we hopefully again, get them, hit them again one more time. So we're, we try to really do a mixture of between the two because we do have our LMS, which we call the blend that, you know, courses go live on and our, our engagement rate is pretty high because um, we're pushing the heck out of it and and franchisees get it's it's documented on a scorecard for them as well so they're more attuned to it um because we did find when people get rewarded or scored on something they're like oh heck no we're gonna make <laughs> sure we do what we need to do um so that's the other thing that we've kind of implemented to help um evolve uh our training process a little bit more to just call more attention to it the uh the shift huddle is a is a great idea. Just I'm glad you said that. It's something that we uh, we have not kind of formally instituted here, but I'm used to them just from my career, and I remember how positive they were. And uh, I we've talked about this on uh, some of our recent store openings that it's a piece that's that's missing um, in a corporate environment. That's a little easier to execute because you have control over the person executing it. In a franchise environment, it is a little tougher because you have to. Uh, convince them that this is the right thing to do. And even if we're executing it, because uh, we've, we've tried, at least on the store openings, to get it to carry over can be uh, a little tough. But I agree, like the, the shift huddle and then mapping out the shift. Hey, this is where everybody's going to work. Going as far as to schedule people, uh, whatever scheduling system you're using, but scheduling them into the positions when you build a schedule. So there's no question about where they're going to work. Um, uh, Salad Station is, uh, at least from my remembrance of Smoothie King, was fairly similar. There's not a lot of designated positions. There's a register and there's everything else, right? So uh, that's kind of how we are as well. But giving people physical positions to to uh, be in during a uh, especially busy shifts, I think, uh, can be very helpful. But um, on the the specific topic, uh, which I think was technology versus um, non tech uh, training, uh, I researched quite a few of them. Uh, you know, the challenge for us, because we're a small brand, is always uh, the cost of those things. Um, so that tends to filter out a lot of the options. There are some relatively affordable ones. Um, we have not taken the step of formalizing uh, any type of um, digital training tool. We use the tools that are digital that we have to kind of communicate and uh, get information out and then, and then do follow up. But I do believe it's in our near-term future. I, I, I do think it's just inevitable uh, that we uh, find one and are communicating with team members uh, directly via their device, whether it's TikTok, you know, uh, those examples. It's, although it's good to hear that you guys are doing that and because uh, it's discussions that we've had as well here. Is that, a, is that a forum that we should be using to work with our team members, uh, even YouTube for training videos? And then the question is, well, how do you control access? Who's going to have the access? Right. Is it limited or is it open? Right. So you make that choice. Mm -hmm. Then if it's limited, who's going to control it? Right. Is a is the franchisee or the manager actually going to go in and create an account for every team member? And then when that team member leaves, they're going to mm -hmm. uh, they're going to take away that account and then they're going to add that. And so I could see that even in the best case scenario, sometimes taking a while. Right. I would imagine when you onboard somebody, they probably need the access right away is the manager or franchisee, do they have the time to go create that access? So these are just all discussions that we're having internally uh, about those types of tools. And um, it hasn't quite made it to the very front of the line for us, uh, but it is, uh, I would say, within probably the top six of things we're looking at. And as we can afford them, which are the things that we're going to pick? And that is uh, coming up very soon. I think we're going to make a decision on that. I think it's something that we're going to need is as we get bigger, it's just, mm -hmm. it's just going to be necessary. We're at 34 stores now. So it's uh, to administer everything, you know, physically can, it's just becoming uh, a lot. And so uh, the ability to train via the device, I think would, uh, is in our near term future. We've, uh, Catherine, we've had 
uh, we've even had some franchisees that have opted to do supplement technology for them um, that they've reached reach research on their own um, to implement, whether it's through food labeling systems that they're like, oh, I, you know, all my team members have an account through food labeling to do food safety labels, but also that's where I can put links and videos and things that I've created on my own um, because they're technologically savvy. Um, and they just felt like, you know, it, it, it would help their business run more efficiently. Um, and some have done it with just one store. Um, and it's just uh, smaller local regional type places that they, they work with to implement. So I would also encourage folks to research what's around them. Um, you know, it might not be something that everyone can do, um, but definitely, you know, if you um, research and look into it, you'll, you'll find some ways that'll make it easier for you as well um, versus a bigger LMS type program right. that you, you know, might not have the, the um, breath to put in place yet. Yeah. And I think that's a good point too, Catherine, around, you know, the, look, at the end of the day, the franchisee is responsible for the success of their business, right? And so if they um, have the access to tools to, to use, I love that, you know, you guys are encouraging them. Yeah. If you think this is going to make a difference in your business, go, go for it. Um, get your team members trained because it's going to help everybody. All right. So what I'm taking away from this awesome conversation is when thinking about training materials, think about them in two different audiences, your franchisee audience and your line employee audience, and then um, making sure that the information is available in multiple formats. So both digitally through video and if you have an LMS um, through the tools that you have available there, but also uh, in in store, right? So the physical things, and then I think you made a great point around what is the what is the operations in the in the store, and are you incorporating training into it? So we talked about the pre shift meeting um, and the rollout uh, information as well. Um, so awesome, awesome takeaways. Um, I think you know, Catherine. The other thing that I would mention that you said was around. Um, holding your franchisees accountable to reviewing the training materials and making it part of their compliance checklist um, is a great way of, of bringing that accountability to life. Um, so awesome feedback, awesome insights. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. And we will see you guys next time on Dear Franny. If you have a question for Dear Franny, please don't hesitate to email us at hello at franchisefractionals.com. All right, we'll talk to you guys later.